I've never been able to forget that voice. He called himself many names, but mostly Bill or Fred. I still listen to the 180 hours of tapes I recorded during the investigation. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to be talking about the Enfield Horror or the Haunting, uh, which some of you may or may not know. I would imagine a lot of you know about this case with the haunting of the family in North London, uh, which uh, caught media attention and I think it's one of those worldwide cases. Um, so I thought I'd do this episode uh, today because it's the uh, Halloween month, it's October and the other thing is I haven't actually um, done an episode on ghosts yet, um, I think I sort of touched on the ghost ship with uh, the Mary Celeste but it doesn't really count because uh, today's episode I'm going to be talking about um, a poltergeist which I haven't brought up yet and I'll be going into where that name comes from and when we first heard about Poltergeist and stuff like that. But I think generally before I talk about this case, I think ghosts in general is just a common to- topic but amongst us. It's one of those conversations that you can get into anywhere. Um, I've had them at parties, weddings, barbecues, you know. <laughs> you know, when you have a conversation you, you get into what's going on in the news and then all of a sudden you get into that oh do you believe in ghosts and more often than not with this conversation i think people generally put something on the table generally have a little bit of interest with this one um you might meet the odd person and might just say no i don't believe in it at all but i think there's a quite a high percentage of people who do have a little bit of a curiosity with this one so um so this case today, the Enfield Haunting, so a quick synopsis on this, it's the supernatural, it's some supernatural activity at 284 Green Street, North London, in a suburb called uh, Brimsdown, and this case, ha- well this event happened between 1977 and 1979, so to be precise, I think it was on the 30th of August 1977. Um, so back in this time, you had a uh, single parent, Pe- Peggy Hodgson. Uh, I think she was about 41 years old. And she had a family of four children. And back in this time, in this sleepy suburb, everybody seemed to know everybody. And it was quite unusual to have someone who was a single parent as well. So in this community, people were like looking out for her as well. Um and through the course of the this this event uh, you had uh, furniture that was moving knocking noises and as I, as i mentioned this caught the attention of the media and it went on to to involve 30 people in in total um investigators um journalists and the neighbors got involved um, so yeah, this this was a this was a big case, and the other thing is with this case, I do find it quite spooky. There's something spooky about a house being haunted that involves uh, children as well. Um, you know, I am a bit of a I do like my horror movies. If you listen to my other show, Bite Size Cinema, um, but. Is something about it when it involves children being haunted, and um, I've just covered the movie The Shining, and that's got uh, it's to do with that as well. So it just gives you that sort of shiver. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to I'm going to look into everything. When I it, when I have a look into these cases, I try to have a look at everything, and you know how you could probably try and disprove this case, or whether there's anything in there where you can say actually you, you can't disprove it that's a little bit strange so I'll um, I'll have a look into everything here so to start with um, let's kick this off with the first event so it's August the 30th 1977 uh, two children uh, you had Janet and Margaret they went to bed and during the night they complained of the oak chest that started moving by itself they went to go and speak to their mum Peggy 
and at first Peggy thought they were just playing about and she told them to go back to bed and then when she went into the room she started seeing the chest moving and the, and the cupboard door was opening up by themselves and she thought this is strange, this is weird and uh, Peggy thought at this time there's no there's no way that those children could do this by themselves where they're in bed and then try and move the chest there's no like pull strings or anything like that she then got she then got so concerned about this that she called the police for their help um, and this is where it gets interesting to start with where you had uh, WPC Caroline Heaps who turned up to take the initial report and when she was in the kitchen with uh, Peggy taking the report the the chair in the kitchen um, moved across the room by itself and Caroline looked to the chair and she couldn't see anything that could suggest that this was pulled by strings, she couldn't find anything, it's just that it moved by itself. Um, police were baffled, baffled with this case and again you've got to look at it, it's 1977, you know there's no sort of social media and I'm going to go into the sort of influence um, in a minute. Um, but police took a report, but because there was nothing that they could connect to, like a suspect or an offender, they, they couldn't do anything about this case. So it then moves on to um, the media getting involved, and it was actually the, the Daily Mirror, and there was a journalist that turned up called Graham Morris, um, and he spent some time at the house. And he said that he witnessed things flying around the room, uh, Lego bricks by themselves. Um, so they started hitting the headlines. And it also captured the attention of the Society for Physical Research. Uh, it's pretty cool actually, SPR. They go around and investigate paranormal events. So these, these, <laughs> these are the Ghostbusters. Um, from the 1970s, but they actually go back, I didn't realise how old this organisation was, it actually goes back to 1882, they're based in Kensington, um, believe it or not, but they're there, they're there to investigate this stuff, they're a non-profit organisation, and the person who was involved in this case was a chap called Morris Gross, he was an inventor, quite an interesting guy, he served in World War II, he was involved in the Dunkirk um, campaign. He was most famous for inventing the rotating billboard. So there's a little bit about Morris. I could actually do an episode on him. He's quite an interesting bloke. Um, and the the unfortunate thing at the time with him, and this this will all I will put all this together later on. Uh, he was actually suffering a personal tragedy. Um, he he was still mourning this event. I mean, you're never going to get over this one with the fact that his daughter died in a motorcycle accident in 1976. So, um, and by his own admission, this actually uh, the reason why he he joined the organisation, the SPR, was because he thought that if there's some way I can try and contact my daughter, and you know, if there is an afterlife, maybe this might help me out. So you got to. Just bear that in mind for this case as well. So he's turned up and he's investigating in the strange happenings in uh, 284 Green Street. And he spent a lot of time there. He's, he's the guy who basically took hold of this case and he's, he's got lots of video footage and um, audio tape, tape recordings and he's witnessed a lot of stuff himself. Um, this, a lot of audio sound clips that he captured. In fact, here's just one right now. Let's play this. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. You're invisible? Why are you invisible? I'm a G. Because I'm a G H O S T. Yes, he had quite a sense of humour. He also used to swear a lot as well. Um, so there you go, you know, you listen to this stuff and it does kind of creep you out, it does creep me out, you know. Um, I think out of all the paranormal stuff, this or the mystery stuff that I do, this one creeps me out the most. Um, and clowns as well, can't stand clowns, they're creepy. Um, so yeah, so you've got, got Morris, he's, he's investigating the case. And then the other person who helps Morris out is a chap called... Guy Lyon Playfield, there's a name. He's a writer, he's a 
parapsychologist, telekinesis, telepathy, pseudoscience, he's into all that. Um, he studied, studied at Cambridge University, uh, national service with the RAF, uh, journalist for Life magazine, you know, that's, that's the thing with this case, you know, you, you've got the initial Enfield haunting, but um, when I looked into this, I thought, actually, the, the, the people who are actually investigating this are quite interesting characters. It, it's like, as I said, it's like Ghostbusters. You've got Morris, who's a you know ex-World War II veteran who's turned up, who's led an incredible life, and then you've got Playfield who turns up, you know, journalist for Life magazine. Um, he also investigated a strange case out in South America as well, uh, to do with uh, parapsychology or something like that, uh, where he witnessed some strange events. So um, they got a little bit of clout behind them, these 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 guys. So um, definitely two blokes I like to have a pint with down the pub and hear their stories, you know. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, you, you then get uh, American demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren who turn up. They turn up a little bit later. They visited the house in 1978. Um, Ed and Lorraine Warren, you, you may or may not have heard of them, but they, they're famous for the uh, uh, the Annabelle doll. They've investigated 10,000 cases um, around the way, world of uh, paranormal activity. Uh, they're famous for being in the uh, Conjuring uh, movies. Uh, in fact, one of the Conjuring movies was to do with the Enfield case and obviously the, the Annabelle doll as well. Dolls, again, uh, just completely freak me out. So they got in, they got involved with this as well, but only briefly. They just turned up for a day or two. Um, but um, Morris and Playfield were the, were the main two to investigate. And during the course of the... I think it was like the three years that they investigated it. Um, they f they did think that this was a genuine case, although uh, Playfield was a little bit more sceptical with the two children, um, saying that they, on, on occasions, may have played up the events with some tricks. Um, but that the, the girls themselves actually came out and said, yeah, okay, I, I do get the reason why... Um, Playfield may have made that comment, but when I when I looked into that, what the girls have said is that they they themselves try to disprove this themselves by trying to trick the paranormal investigators to see um, if if they picked up on that as well. So I think the girls were trying to sort of see if they could try and disprove it or prove it themselves. So it's kind of like one playing off the, um, against the other, but I think the actual um, core event that started in the first place to sort of ignite this is probably the one that you want to look at the most um, because that's that's your ignition. So the the night that the two girls saw the wardrobe wobble, um, is is it is it just a case of the girls that are playing the mum up for a little bit of a, a bit of attention? But then something spooked out the mother enough for her to call the police. Um, and then this this leads on to something that I had a look at with this case, which I, I thought today, with everything that we've got social media-wise, there's, there's a lot of um, videos out there, people claiming that they've seen ghosts. Um, because we've now got the power of... Um, you know, like using CGI on our phones, you know, people can probably create like a ghost image and you see a lot of videos on YouTube and stuff like that. And what I thought was, well, could was there an influence like that in 1970? Was there an influence like that in 1977? So what I took a look at was um, stuff that was kicking around at that time. Um, so in the movies, uh, 1974, Three, or no, sorry, 1975. You had the Amateurville Horror that came out in 1975. So um, that was a story that one of I will be covering actually um, this month. But I remember going to school and hearing people talking about that case, and it kind of freaked me out. Um, you also had the Omen 
that came out in 1976, a year before this case. You had Carrie, Stephen King's Carrie, the girl with the telekinesis. Uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was like a banned movie. Um, you also had uh, books at school. So you might... The, uh, I think the, the pub publication of ghost books was quite big in the 70s as well. Uh, I think you had a book called The World of the Unknown, which I seem to remember with ghosts on the front page. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying here is, uh, uh, is it possible that these girls have gone to school and been freaked out by, you remember, I certainly remember this, the playground talk when you talk to your friends. Now, these children at this age may not have had access to be able to watch these films because no one, I don't think anybody even had a v VHS recorder back then. But it could just be that the parents have told them about these, you know, the, there's a film at the cinema called The Omen, the Amateurville Horror, you know, because these are like stories just to sort of scare the children a bit. And it, is it possible that these these two children have heard this story, freaked themselves out, and thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could scare our mum and pretend there's a ghost, you know? So there's... There's two ways of looking at this. Is it is it the fact that these two girls are just trying to sort of freak their mum out? And then the mum would just come up and say, look, kids, just go go back to bed. But Peggy, the mum, has then gone upstairs and it seems in this case that she's kind of witnessed something herself. Um, and it, it seems like it's possibly something that's out of character for her as well, being a single mother. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of avenues to go down here, and I think it's to try and work out this case. You've got to go back to that first first event. So um, I know a lot of people have said with the Enfield case, it is just a couple of kids that are craving a little bit of attention first by their mum, but then because the mum's called called the police because she she you know she may have been in fear of something, and quite rightly so. Um, it it's then gone on to a number of other events where the police have been called then journalists have got involved and then the next thing you know it's all in the papers and these two children are probably might, might have been thinking wow this is this is quite an exciting time or or is it something that is is genuine you know is there a genuine ghost haunting this house and I think with the Enfield case you've you've got two You've got two paths that you can follow here. And when you look into the case, I think it's down to you whether you just kind of make your own mind up about it. Um, so let's go back on to, kind of sort of steering off the track a little bit here, but let's come back on to, uh, I was going to mention about the actual poltergeist itself. Uh, let's talk about that. So the name poltergeist is actually German and it, it, it means loud ghost and it is described as an entity that can move object move objects and harass its victims uh, it's found in many many different cultures around the world and dates back as early as the first century um, and it was more common actually uh, in this country in the 17th century um, and there is actually a first case out there that goes back to 1654 in Glasgow and it's called the Glendus Devil. Um, and then following on from that, there's 20 other recorded case or recorded cases. And the the recent the one that was uh, more recent before the Enfield um, haunting was actually the the Amateurville Horror. Um, so yeah, so so poltergeist is is a thing. So you know that's the other thing. There are it, it goes back. I didn't realise how far back it actually went to, um, you know, going back to the 17th century. So there's a little bit of um, there was a little bit of a building block here um, with these cases. And um, as I mentioned before, there are when you when you talk to people, people do generally come out and say, you know, I've been I've been spooked out by something. Um, so it, I would say that it is very plausible that something like this could happen and something may have been going on in in that house and um leading on from that um 
Now, through the, through the course of the investigation with the uh, SPR, uh, with Morris's recordings and the investigations, um, as, I, as I've already mentioned, there was a little bit of speculations that the kids may have been playing up. Um, but as I've already mentioned, that was because they were just trying to sort of see if they could try and disprove it themselves. Um, there was actually pictures of the girls either levitating, which you can, you can see on Google. And again, you can you, you can take that with a pinch of salt. Is it is it something paranormal? Is it just the girls jumping off the bed and it's just like the trick of the photography at the time? Um, there's also talks of the little girl Janet being possessed by the poltergeist itself. And this now leads on to what the poltergeist might be. Uh, now there was a grumpy old man that used to live in the house and his name was called Bill Wilkins. And he died in the house back in the 60s. And and the way he died was in a chair in, in the lounge. And this kind of just tie, tie up because when Janet is supposedly possessed, she, she puts on a gruff old voice and I think she mentions the name Bill. And she describes how he passed away and that he doesn't want to doesn't want to leave the house. And this um, got verified by Bill's son, uh, by like two of the investigators, Morris. They they contacted the son just to verify this, and they got a little bit of you know character information of Bill, and he confirmed, yeah, he was a grumpy old man. Um, so this does tie up, and I suppose you've got to ask yourself, you know. I suppose this just sort of bumps up the case a little bit because how would it, it just uh, does seem a bit strange that the two girls um, are saying they've been possessed by this character and would Peggy have known that before she she bought the house possibly um, would she have told the children that this man died in the house I don't know so um, possibly being a single parent I don't think it would hurt to you know, if if the mum did know that, she probably would have kept that information from the kids because you wouldn't really want to. I wouldn't really want to say that to my my kids if I was in a house. Um, but there you go. I just you you know, it's one of those things. Um, but because Janet was saying that she was possessed, um, and there was actually again, I think there's audio. Um, footage of um, her talking with the, the Bill Gruff's voice um, this is where again there's so many people involved with this case they, they even brought in um, an American magician called Milbourne Christopher you know <laughs> dun, dun, dun. He, needs a, he needs a drum roll with that voice with that, with that sort of name <laughs> and imagine him turning up with a cape and a wand you know um, but he came in as well to see if he could find anything paranormal. Um, again, I don't think they really came to any sort of conclusion. Also brought in a ventriloquist called Ray Ray Allen um, to to see if he could sort of try and prove this or disprove it. So there's a there was an awful lot, you know, of people um, involved. And through the you know the course of the three years, you know, photos of the the children levitating. Like I say, the possessions with the gruff voice bouncing off the bed, um, furniture moving, um, neighbours saying that they they witnessed this um, from from outside. You know, looking through the windows. Um, uh, Morris and Playfield saying that they witnessed as well. Playfield a little bit on the fence with it all. Um, so yeah, it's you know all round it's a it's an interesting case, and I'm. For this episode, I'm basically just bringing this to the table, just in a sort of type of 30-minute episode. There are there is an awful lot more that that I could go into, but I could possibly be here for hours. But on a, on a, on a sort of nutshell, you know, I'll tell you what. I, you know, I'm going to get to the point now where where I'll tell you what I I think of this um, this case, um, and I've already already touched on this with with the episode. Is could it just be that you know? A small incident, say, of two kids that, and you remember, it, this kind of goes back to it being unusual that, you know, Peggy is a single parent. You may have two young children, might have been craving just a little bit of attention or just messing about like kids do. And they just thought, 
you know, I've heard in the playground that there's, you know, a film called The Amateurville. I'm just saying, just a little bit of an example. Well, kids are talking about ghost stories. Let's play mum up and pretend there's a ghost in the room. And let's be a little bit clever about it and try and make it look like the drawers are going to open up by themselves. And then you've got your mum that comes in and gets freaked out by it and gets freaked out by it so much that she calls the police. And then for the kids, maybe just to sort of think, oh, let's, let's spook out the police officers as well. Maybe they might have conducted the, the moving of the chair. I'm just putting this one out there. And then from there onwards, it's just gone boom. And could could that happen? Yeah, I think it could. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 uh, it, it's a possibility that the Enfield case is something that has just gone boom out of proportion. And I think that's well worth considering here. Um, and then when you get all the media attention... Now, look, this, these are two young girls. You know, kids are kids. You know, being a parent myself, they, you know, used to get up to mischief myself when I was a kid and what have you. Um, could it just be that they're just thinking, I'm liking this because we've got the press round, we've hit the news, we're getting all this attention. Let's keep it going. And it's just gone on and on and on. And because it's the 70s, and you've got to remember, um, ghost stories was just starting to, you know, pick up a bit in the media. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just gone out of proportion. Or, the other way of looking at it, there really is a poltergeist in there. And these events really did happen. And could you imagine from the mother's perspective that it is pretty damn you know scary so scary that she's called the police and gone i need some help here guys because there is something going wrong with this house and then from there onwards down the other path all the events are true and these girls are getting possessed and you think to yourself that is pretty damn scary if that's true so i think the best way to look at the enfield case is in two two paths one is blowing out proportion or two this case is real and if it's real it's damn damn scary as well and I would say both cases are plausible um, when, when you think about it uh, but uh, the other thing is you know that there's there's gonna be a line down the middle here between these two paths it's a good story you know it's it's you know whether, whether it's re real or not the Enfield case when you read it and you look at it, would it spook you out? Yeah, I think it will. Um, is it a good story? Yeah. Um, so, it's one of those cases where you've got to make your own mind up about it, I think. Um, but it, it spawned, you know, books, uh, TV shows. There's The Enfield Haunted with Timothy Spall. That's really good. Uh, there's The Conjuring. Um, so... Yeah, that, that's a that's a good movie as well, especially for Halloween at the moment to have a look at. Um, before I close the show, let's just quickly talk about what happened to the family. Um, uh, so as a conclusion, oh, this is worth mentioning, I've got to mention this as well. In 1978, a priest visited the house and blessed it and then things quieted down. Um, Janet... At 16 years old, she left home and she got married quite young. Um, her mum, Mrs. Hodgson, she remained in the house until um, her death in 2003. Uh, 2003. Now, this house is still occupied um, today. There's a family that don't, don't want to make themselves known who live in the house. But the family that took over from 2003 only stayed in the house for six months. Um, apparently they didn't know anything about what went on in there. Some spooky things started going on and they can take it, so they, they left. So, um, so yeah, uh, the question I suppose you've got to ask yourself is, would anybody listening, now any of you listeners out there, would you want to live in this house? Whether you believe in it or not, no. Nah, I'll tell you now, I'll put that card on the table, I don't think I would. Um, so yeah, I think I'd be too spooked out by it because that's the other thing. It's the power of uh, the imagination, isn't it? If someone tells you there's a haunted house and you go in, you, I think your mind can play tricks with you as well. So there's a bit of food for thought. But there you go. That is the um, Enfield haunting. Uh, there are there's some stuff I've skipped over here, guys. I've given you a bit of a roundup. 
Um, but check it out on Google. There's some really interesting stories here. Um, when you look at this case, it's it's worth um, taking a look at if you want to have a look at it in a little bit more um, depth. But uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hopefully that's uh, entertained you for, for 30 minutes of whether you're on a commute or whether you just fancy hearing my tones. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm going to wrap this up now. Um but I will be coming back again for some spooky stuff. The next one I'm going to be doing is the um, Amateurville Haunting, which um, gets even weirder. And it is quite a tragic case. So uh, that's going to be my next episode. So um, that will be dropping in the next week or so. Um, so yeah, there we go, guys. As a little bit of admin for the show. I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. So please uh, check out all the other shows on there. Including my other show, Bite Size Cinema Podcast, where I've just dropped the um, Shining, and I'll be doing a few other horror movies for um, Halloween. And you can find uh, the Mystery Vault Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and several other players on the internet. If you type in the Mystery Vault Podcast on Google, it will take you to somewhere where you can listen to the show. Uh, I've also got a Facebook page where um, I'm most active. That's the best place to contact me. Um, if there's anything that you uh, want to want me to take a look at, put it on there. I'll be happy to have a look. And there's plenty of mysteries and strange stuff going on out there in the world. So uh, there you go, guys. Um, as always, hope you didn't get too spooked out by that. Uh, keep it spooky. Keep it safe. And I will see you soon. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. Sitting here in this room is a well. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.